What is the value of human life? Is it worth 10,000 euro, 20,000, 50,000, 100,000, maybe even a million? And if one life is worth 1 million euro, are two lives worth 2 million and 10 lives worth 10 million? You could approach these questions from a rational perspective and construct a normative model for the valuing of the saving of human lives. According to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, all human beings are born free, and this is important, equal in dignity and rights. So if you believe that all human lives are of equal value, the value of saving 10 lives should be worth 10 times as much as saving one life, right? Now, this is a normative model. This describes how life should be valued, but it doesn't necessarily describe the way we actually value human life. Consider, for instance, this experiment. People were asked to donate some of their, some of their money to a charity to save the life of Rokia, a starving girl in Mali, Africa. People, on average, contributed 35% of their money. A second independent group of people was asked to save the life of Musa, a boy in the exact same situation as Rokia, and on average, people contributed about the same. And this is important. A third group of people was asked to save the life of Rokia and Musa, right? According to the rational model, you would expect that people would donate more to save the lives of two children than to save the life of one child, right? Maybe you wouldn't expect them to donate 75%, but you would at least expect them to donate more than to save one child, right? Now, in reality, people actually gave less, right? So here's a case where people seem to value the saving of two lives worth less than saving the value of one life, right? And this has been found over and over in experiments. Here in this one, people contributed more to save one victim than to save seven victims. The explanation that's typically offered is that it's difficult to emotionally engage with a group of people. Empathy, emotions, compassion are much easier to evoke when we're talking about one specific, concrete, identifiable person than a group of people. A group of people easily turns into a statistic. So, back to our normative model. It seems to not provide an accurate description of how we actually value life. As a matter of fact, it may look like this. Our valuation may be highest when we're talking about one specific concrete individual, but it starts to decline as we start, start talking about two people, and may even entirely collapse when we, stock, when we start talking about larger values of N. And this is not some experimental artifact. Even Mother Teresa, one of the most saint and holy people you could possibly imagine, she said, if I look at a group of people, I won't help, I won't act. But if I look at a one specific individual, I will start to, to act. Now, instead of looking at holy people, saint people like Mother Teresa, I have tried to understand how regular people like you and me value human life. And I did so um, by looking at our response to natural disasters. Together with Yanis Evangelidis, one of our doctoral students here at Erasmus University, I looked at natural disasters, a, a variety of natural disasters. We looked at hurricanes, we looked at earthquakes, we looked at wildfires, we looked at volcano eruptions, flooding, we looked at tsunamis, we looked at landslides, avalanches, and so on. Now, these events, they destroy the infrastructure of a country or region. But more important, they also threaten the social fabric of a community. This woman, for instance, lost 10 of her family members due to an earthquake in 2010 in Shuzu County. As a matter of fact, in the past 10 years, almost 900,000 people have lost their lives as a result of a natural disaster. Now, evidently, some of these disasters are much more serious than others. So for instance, the earthquake in the Indian Ocean um, and the resulting tsunami killed more than 200,000 people in more than 14 different countries. And the Haiti earthquake also um, cost the lives of many thousands of people. Now, these serious disaster may, 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 see, may make seem the death toll of these smaller disasters somewhat small in comparison, but I want to mind you, we're talking here about human lives, right? We're not talking about mere statistics, right? So to answer the question, what is the value of a human life, we looked at donations provided by you, right? donations to disaster relief funds, to be able to quantify what the value of a human life actually is. Okay? We looked at two things. We looked at donation probability, the chance that you would donate to a disaster relief fund, and we also looked at donation amount as a function of how many people were actually killed in a natural disaster. And what we found was when more people are killed in natural disaster, people donate more, right? If you look at donation amount as a function of how many people were killed in a natural disaster, we also found that people are willing to contribute more money, larger sums of money, when more people die. So back to our models here, right? 
we, are, we seem to be generous when more people die. Right? And to give a very specific answer to the question, what's your valuation of human life, our statistical analyses indicated around 7,000 euro is donated for each additional person that is killed in a natural disaster. And you may think this is good news, right? You may think this is rational, right? Back to our models. You may think we're behaving according to that yellow line, right? Because we seem to be more generous when more people die. But upon closer inspection, it's not. Because the money that you donate to disaster relief funds doesn't end up with the people who died, right? It ends up with the people who are alive and who survived the disaster. And with your money that you donate, these people could make it through another day. Right? The money that you donate won't bring back the people who lost their lives, but could increase the chances that those who are alive could actually survive. Right? To give some examples, in the aftermath of a disaster, some people need medical assistance. They need surgery after they've been rescued from a collapsed building. Due to herding, food and water may not be readily available. Right? Farmlands may be destroyed, crops may be inundated, people have no access to, to food, so food kits may need to be distributed with helicopters to isolated uh, regions that are cut off by a natural disaster. Other people need drinking water, especially after a natural disaster. It can be incredibly difficult to make sure that the water is distributed to the people who are actually in great need. Right? And your money will be spent on trying to get those supplies to the affected population. Other people may have lost their house, and they need shelter, as this dramatic picture illustrates. Your money will be spent on providing temporary shelter, so that the likelihood that people would die from the cold, especially in winter, could decrease. And good sanitation, good personal hygiene, could prevent the spreading of illnesses and diseases, which is incredibly difficult in the aftermath of a disaster. So, for all the disasters that happened in the past decade, we have information about how many people are in need of food, water, medical assistance, shelter, and so on, right? In total, um, more than 900 million people are affected by natural disasters. And we have information about how many people are affected. And what is important, you can't rely on the number of people that died in a natural disaster to predict how many people are actually in great need. There is only a very sweet, weak or small correlation between how many people died and how many people are actually in need. Take a look at this graph. The, the most serious disasters in terms of lives affected are not the Haiti earthquake in 2010 or the, 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 the tsunami, but are the massive floods in China in 2010 and 2003, which affected the lives of more than 100, 100 million people. In total, as I mentioned before, more than 800 million people were in great need of food, water, medical assistance, shelter, and so on. Okay? So think about it, right? If we are sensitive to how many people die in a natural disaster, we should be even more sensitive to how many people are in need. And this is a picture taken a few days ago in Tacloban in the Philippines, where the typhoon Haiyan killed a few thousands of people, but many hundreds of thousands of people are in great need of our help. Right? So we should especially be sensitive to how many people are in need after a disaster. So we looked at the data. Right? Again, we looked at donation probability, the chances that somebody would donate, and we looked at donation amount now as a function of how many people are in need rather than how many people are killed. And what we found was actually quite disturbing. People are completely insensitive to how many people are in need. So whether there's more or few people in need, people simply don't seem to care. Now, there could be a very sensible explanation for this. Journalists may be more likely, for instance, to cover sensational stories, right? Disasters that kill many people and leave those disasters that affect many people completely unattended. For instance, the, the earthquake in Haiti has dominated our news reports, but the floodings in China in 2010 may not have really caught our attention. Right? So we set out to test um, where this could be a viable explanation by running a series of behavioral experiments. We asked people how much should be donated when this specific disaster hits this specific region. And the only thing that we varied, the only thing that we changed was whether fewer or more people died or fewer or more people were in great need of assistance. What we found consistently throughout our experiments is that people want to donate more and more people die, but they're completely insensitive to how many people are in need. And mind you, here, an explanation in terms of biased media reports cannot account for this because the disaster was equally salient for all of these people, right? So to summarize, it seems that we value death rather than life, right? So it seems that we want to spend 7,000 euro and give it to a corpse rather than to somebody who is alive and need our, needs our assistance, right? This is 
quite disturbing if you think about it, right? Because it, it seemed that we're not rational, right? Instead of donating twice as much when the number of lives at stake doubles, we're completely and largely insensitive to how many people are in need. And this is disturbing because this means that in the aftermath of a natural disaster, a humanitarian disaster could take place, right? If money is raised in an efficient way. So what is going on, right? What is the problem? And if we understand the problem, what is the solution to this? Okay. If we're confronted with news reports, we typically get two pieces of information. Unfortunately, we rely on only one piece of information, and to make things even worse, we rely on the wrong piece of information, right? We focus on the people that died, and not so much on the people who are affected by a natural disaster. To explain why this is so, I need to introduce two very important constructs. Imagine you're testing four different guns at a shooting range, right? So you test the first gun by shooting at a target. The first gun that you test turns out to be pretty awful. The shots are widely dispersed. There's a lot of noise, there's a lot of error, right? The gun is not precise. And on top of that, you don't seem to hit the center of the target. You don't seem to hit the right spot, the appropriate spot. So you try a second gun. The second gun seems a bit better. It has precision. You repeatedly hit the same spot over and over again. But unfortunately, you seem to be hitting the wrong spot. You don't hit the center of the target. So you try a third gun. The third gun, actually, on average, you're shooting at the right spot. You're shooting at the appropriate spot. But again, the, the gun lacks precision. There's a lot of error. There's a lot of variability. So you try the fourth gun, and the fourth gun turns out to be actually the best. Right? You hit the center of the target, and you do so with great precision. The two important constructs here are reliability and validity. Reliability refers to the extent to which you're comp cons consistently hitting the same target over and over again. It refers to precision. It refers to the lack of error or the lack of variance, irrespective of whether you're hitting the right target. Validity, on the other hand, refers to whether you're hitting the right spot, right? the center of the target, whether you're hitting at the, at the, at the, at the appropriate spot, right? irrespective of the variability of your shots. Now, back to our disasters. Okay? The number of fatalities, the number of people that is killed, is a reliable piece of information. Figuring out whether somebody's dead or alive is pretty easy. Right? Either you're dead or alive. There's no gray zone. Right? It's perceived to be a very reliable piece of information that you could use to estimate how deserving a disaster is for your money. Right? Contrast it with the number of injured people. This is a valid cue. Right? On average, you're shooting at the right spot but it's perceived to be an unreliable cue. If I tell you this person is injured, what does it mean to be injured? This person could have a scratch, but he could also have lost a leg or an arm. Right? So it seems that when we confront it with these two pieces of information, we seem to attach different weights to that. Right? And whenever we're donating to disasters, it seems that we're giving much more weight to the number of dead people, which actually doesn't make any sense. But it's, it is because we attach importance, we attach weight, to reliable information rather than valid information. So how could we solve that? The, the solution is actually quite easy. Increasing perceived validity and increasing perceived reliability. If I ask you which of these two disasters deserves your money more, one disaster has a high number of dead people and low, low number of needy people, and the other way around, you're confronted with this trade-off, right? You have to solve this conflict. How are you going to do that? By looking at the valid pieces of information. You realize that the number of needy people is actually a piece of information that should be driving your donation decision, right? And you stop using invalid information. Priming validity is one solution. The other one is trying to increase perceived reliability. Instead of using terms like, there's 10,000 injured people, there's millions of people who are affected, there's thousands of people who are in need, Instead of using those vague, ambiguous, unreliable terms, so to say, one should better use more reliable terms, like so many people have lost their house. Because house, home, being homeless, is like a one or zero variable. It's like being dead or alive. Either you lost your house or you're not. If you increase the perceived reliability of information, people are much more likely to take it into account in their decision and behave in a much wiser way. So to come back to my initial question, what is the value of human life? Frankly, I don't know. 
right? And maybe it's even inappropriate to ask such a question. And maybe the answer is, the value of life is priceless, especially if you're talking about your child or about your significant others, about your partner, your mother or your father. Maybe it's impossible to study that, but I do think it's possible to study the factors that lead us to lead to an increase or a decrease in our valuations of the value of a human life, right? I'm a marketing professor. I try to study how people make decisions, how they spend their money, right? And we know that people not always spend their money wisely. It may be somewhat strange to think in terms of marketing natural disasters, but I tend to believe that there's not a great difference between spending your money on charity A and not on charity B versus spending your money on product A and product B, right? Trying to understand how consumers, how donors, how you and me make decisions is incredibly, incredibly important. Why? Because it can help us design tools, frameworks to improve human decision making and to make wiser decisions. And I've shown you we are making sometimes really stupid decisions. I think these insights are also really important for policymakers, politicians, for non-governmental organizations and policymakers who need to raise money in the aftermath of a disaster. Because I've shown you, we tend to forget about the people who are alive and who are in great need of help. And it's especially these people, the fundraising agencies, the non-governmental organizations, the Red Cross and so on, who can make this world into a better place, especially for those who are left behind and have not passed away. So, and this is how I want to conclude. The next time that somebody requests you to donate to charity, I hope your thoughts are with those who are still alive and need your help and not with those who already passed away. Thanks for your attention.